What up, YouTube? Welcome to Chicago Reacts. My name is Jared, as always, joined by Kelly. And today we'll be reacting to Napoleon 1813, Battle of the Nations by Epic History. And uh, pretty excited for this video. What do you think, y'all? Battle of the Nations. Sounds big. Sounds bold. <laughs> as if none of this, the rest of the stuff was. But we'll see what happens here. I think we're getting close to the final chapter. I think we're, I think we're getting pretty close, guys. Uh, the past couple of videos, you know, Napoleon... Fell to Russia a couple of videos ago, and then this past video, um, he's trying to he's trying to get his he's trying to get, get his confidence back. He's trying to win some battles here and there, Dresden, Leipzig, and uh, now we're on to the Battle of the Nations. So this is gonna be a big one. Uh, be sure, guys, before we watch this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and uh, engage with us in the comments. We love doing that with you guys. So with that being said, let's get into the video. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. His long war in Spain had ended in defeat, and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. While in Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies converging on him from all directions. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Prussia, Austria and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. They were now better organised, trained and led and more wary of Napoleon. They're on to him. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg. His was a huge really mixed Austrian-Russian Prussian army Could be. of 194,000 men and 790 guns. <laughs> Close. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. To the north, Blücher's army of Silesia, and the Army of the North, under Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte, now Crown Prince of Sweden. Together, 130,000 men and 536 guns. To the southeast, General Bennigsen's Army of Poland, besieging Dresden. Another 34,000 men and 135 guns. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 men and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. One unique addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North was a single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, a type seen here in 1830. Although wildly inaccurate, their high-explosive warhead could be devastating at close range. Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with, with many experienced troops and commanders, even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make up numbers. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged in Danzig, Marshal Saint-Cyr's 1st Corps besieged in Dresden, Marshal Davout's 13th Corps holding Hamburg, as well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig, with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south, with 90,000 men, covering Schwarzenberg. Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat, and with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg, 
before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. Murat had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. But at Liebert Volkwitz, he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest cavalry battle in Europe's history. Wow. Murat, in the thick of it as usual, the battle nearly of captured by Liebert Prussian Waltz. dragoons. The, the largest cavalry battle in history? Is that what they just said? I th yeah. That's so that wild. means so that means the most amount of horses in a in a single battle, right? Yeah, sounds about I think right. So. Interesting. Battle ended crazy. in a minor coalition victory, with around two thousand casualties on each side. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. This video is sponsored by the Great Courses Plus, home of more than eleven thousand on-demand video lectures covering everything from science and maths to the natural world and history. The Great Courses Plus regularly update their content, so you could watch a documentary on coronavirus, or courses on infectious diseases or historical pandemics. But if you'd prefer a bit of escape, we can recommend the 24-part course The High Middle Ages, exploring every aspect of the medieval world, from feudalism to chivalry. Medieval world, something else I don't know much about. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Story, heretics and crusades. And maybe I guess that means we should subscribe to this and and learn a little bit out. more. Anybody yeah. has anybody subscribed mm. to this? Let us know down in the comments. We'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on this. Honestly, it's it looks like got a lot. it looks pretty interesting. Just a bit of plague. That's more than twelve hours of shared expertise, and the Great Courses Plus have more than a hundred courses on history alone. Each course is hosted by a qualified expert from a top cool. university or institution, such as the Smithsonian. Plus, you get to watch whenever you like, wherever you have your computer, tablet or phone. Support our channel and get access to a ton of great educational content by registering for a free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash epichistorytv or Very click cool. on the link in the mm -hmm. video description. Thank you to the Great Courses Plus. It's like Discovery awesome. Channel on this steroids. Video. Yeah, and it's got like wide variety of everything. Yeah. It's awesome. <clears throat> Children. <laughs> Battle of Leipzig, here we go. By the 16th of October, Napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of Leipzig. Oh, so the Battle of the Nations is okay. Is in Leipzig. Got it. Got it. Oh. At first, I thought Battle of Leipzig was just like a separate battle, but Me too. Battle of the Nations. This Leipzig is the Battle of the Nations. There's multiple days to it. Mm, that makes okay. It. All right, makes sense. Okay. Field Marshal Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, against Russian advice, had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect them for at least another day, and so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg, however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon, with overwhelming superiority in numbers. However, the coalition's headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander, whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Austria, all of whom were present at his headquarters. The plan finally agreed was for General Wittgenstein's corps group to lead an attack in four main columns, 
with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. At 8am, a bombardment began along the line, as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's II Corps then counterattacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. Bacau would change hands twice more that morning. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. At Markleberg, Kleist's Prussian Second Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. While on the left bank of the Pleiser, Merveldt's Austrian Second Corps struggled across broken ground what is to attack well-defended villages. The, the, le the left bank of the Pleiser, is that what he said? This terminology. I don't know, I don't know what a Pleiser is. Is that like P-L-I-C-E-R? -P Pleiser? Anybody know what a Pleiser is? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you. Their assault on Konovitz stalled, but with heavy losses, the Austrians got a toehold in Derlitz. On the right flank, around 10 a.m., Klinau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg and fought its way into Liebert Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. His troops retook the Kolmberg and counterattacked Liebert Wolkwitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. The coalition offensive was going nowhere with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks, But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Goulai's Austrian Third Corps, with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Ney had to divert Bertrand's Fourth Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before launching his attack on Schwarzenberg. But now, 4th Corps was tied down at Lindenau. And there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Heavy fighting broke out around Mürkern the village itself held by elite French marines. While Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Widrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon, who'd thought Blücher was still a day's march away. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia. His actions and the bloody fight for Mürkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. But in the south he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiser River, costing precious hours. Pleiser River. It was now or Pleiser never River. for Napoleon. At 2pm, he ordered the attack 
to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. Cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some even nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. But the ground was marshy and broken by fences and ditches. The French horses were soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Maison's division of the 5th Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Golden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. But as Russian and Prussian guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village, the French were forced to fall back. Around 4pm, the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived and renewed the assault on Markleberg, one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. By 5pm it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Merkern was being stubbornly held by French marines with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian Corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but remained in command. Finally, a brilliant charge by Prussian Hussars triggered a French rout. Merkern fell as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. As dusk fell around 6pm, fighting died out across the battlefield. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. It's not even that much. At least 30,000. Napoleon had come close. Compared to like everything that we've been watching, yeah, I don't, I don't even I don't, know anymore. I don't think it's that much. We got a long way to go in this in this battle. Yeah. But failed to land a decisive blow. On day one, yeah. The chance for victory was slipping from his grasp. Here we go. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Start getting cold again. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor Francis I, suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. But the Allies were no longer interested. They knew time was on their side. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd Cavalry Corps. That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's French Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. But the same day, the coalition received more than 100,000 reinforcements, as their armies continued to converge on Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian 1st Corps. Bennigsen's Army of Poland. And Bernadotte's Army of the North. 
though the latter was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. The next day, Napoleon would face odds of nearly two to one. It was time for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. Monday morning, the sun shone. That's so crazy because Leipzig, I've never, I've never even heard of this. Never so heard of it. Clearly, it's very, like it's, a, it's a big deal. It's the battle of the nations. Yeah, this is a big one. I've never heard of this. Across 40 square miles of battlefield, on which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. Soldiers from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Britain. Wow. This was truly the Battle of the Nations. There, there you go. Yeah. I called it. Preparation. I knew, I knew it. Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter defensive perimeter and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Two divisions of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. Fighting in the south began around 8 a.m. The Austrians took Derlitz, but Marshal Oudinot led a counterattack at the head of a young guard division and drove them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's 3rd Corps. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before, but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more ground to cover, but towards noon, they'd driven back Macdonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right, but the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander, who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Blücher, in contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's northern defences, though their attack failed with heavy losses. By 2pm, Napoleon was hard-pressed on all fronts but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probst Haida, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Probst Haida was soon engulfed in smoke and fire as fighting raged on all sides. Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village, while three French generals were killed as they organised its defence. Napoleon even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. To the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld, which poured fire into the Russian ranks. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. The fields were soon strewn with the dead and wounded, as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3pm, 
von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Paunsdorf. Grenier's 7th Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around 3,000 Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. The hole in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not know. be stopped. What are the Saxons? Do we know that? Did they, did they talk about that already? I'm not sure. I don't know. Saxons, like S-A-X-O-N? It's like a city. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know. Anyone know what the Saxons are? Let us know. Thank you. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld, while the Prussians took Sellerhausen. In the south, Probst Haida still held, but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides another 25,000 casualties. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Wow. I mean, these guys would just do anything for Napoleon. That's what I'm saying, it's crazy. Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls, and at 4am began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River that led back to France. There'd been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly Poles and Germans. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10 a.m. Behind him, there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion, the city's streets jammed with troops, guns and wagons. The 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city, as the coalition launched an all-out assault from north, east and south. The rear guard held the city's gates for as long as they could, but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy, and savage street fighting broke out across the city. The barge, packed with gunpowder, had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge, so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Around 2pm, a corporal lit the fuse when he saw Russian soldiers on the far bank, even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and horses. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong side of the river. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including the Polish Prince Poniatowski, made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. I probably would have Weak from his too. wounds, yeah, he rode I his know, horse sure. into the river. But as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Marshal Macdonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. 
he found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across, when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake, and I fell into the water. Fortunately I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank, and missed me. And some of our men, Donald, man. to be nearby, drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, but they were not to be had. The loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the centre of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 52,000 casualties. Napoleon, who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 yeah. taken prisoner, 325 smaller, guns lost. Much smaller squad. So. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. Wow. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, two days later. A more revolting and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk, or a head only, which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold, to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. Napoleon had suffered a calamitous defeat. He had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, assuring him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau with 40,000 men. The Bavarian commander, von Freda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. The French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. The French army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris to contain the political damage from his defeat. Behind him, his empire was being dismantled. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. 
In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davout, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under siege. Napoleon's situation was desperate. But in the next campaign, fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. What's gonna bring him down? <laughs> He's not done yet. He's not done yet. Uh, that was that was the Napoleon eighteen thirteen battle of the nations by Epic History. Whatever brings him down, if if whatever happens to him, has got to be more legendary than Napoleon. Yeah, I mean uh, the battle of the nations, the biggest uh, the biggest battle. The biggest European battle in history, mm -hmm. besides World War One, did they say? Yeah. So um, if he can make it out of that, he can make it out of anything. Um, I think his, I think his quote at the end, you know, pretty much said it all. When he said, you know, a year ago everybody was marching with us, and now everybody's marching against us. Basically saying that a year ago he had everybody wrapped around his finger, could do whatever he wanted, and get away with it, and no one, just no one could take him down. And then, you know, as the year goes on, um, he's getting exposed. His people are getting exposed and people are just figuring out ways to beat him, you know, battle of the nations. That was, that was no joke. I mean, you're going up, you're going up against the big dogs there. That was like the all-star game of European wars. You got all the big dogs on one field and, um, you know, they, they just figure out, they just, you know, when you're that good at what you do, uh, fighting in war like that. And you, there, there's more of you than there are of him. Uh, you just figure out ways to uh, to get to get around it, to beat him. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, he's he's certainly not done yet, as we saw there. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens next. But uh, thank you guys for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done that already. And check out other check out other videos as well. If there's any other videos that you'd like us to react to. Just let us know down in the comments, and we'll see you guys next time.